Hello, my name is Amy Bohinski, and I'm going to be talking to you about a lesson I've created for a college English class 2324 Readings in American Literature. The title of the lesson is Influences of Fahrenheit 451. In teaching this lesson, I would start off by making sure that the goals of the lesson were clear with the students. Um, that we needed to distinguish between censorship and free will. We need to connect major historical events to Ray Bradbury's purpose of the novel. Determine how cultural views influenced Ray Bradbury in the writing of the novel. Link dystopian society characteristics with Ray Bradbury's views. And finally, assess the student's understanding of the lesson by evaluating the discussion questions students will answer and turn in by the next class period. These goals will cover five key concepts or academic vocabulary, if you will. Censorship, cultural historical context, author's purpose, social conformity, and dystopian society. To start off, my warm-up would consist of a CBS News story that was that was first seen in 2005 on the 70 year anniversary of Hitler's book burning. Um, in this newscast, a the Holocaust Museum was presenting a new exhibit and survivor Hardy Kupferberg in Philadelphia witnessed the bur book burnings as a child. So this newscast was, um, it shows it shows real footage of, of uh, Germans burning books. And, um, and this woman, um, this survivor, Hardy Kupferberg, witnessed it. I, I believe she says she's 10 years old and um, went to the book burning with her father. And uh, it had a, a lasting effect on her life, even to the point that she has wall-to-wall -wall books in her house now um, as she is an adult and just feels like she needs to keep herself surrounded by these books to protect them. I would pose a couple of questions to students. Number one, what type of books did, the, did Nazi Germany burn? What was an illegal or terrible book? Um, why did they burn books at all? What was so terrible inside the book that um, they felt like they needed to just completely get rid of it. And finally, which books, if any, were considered quality books for Germans to read? So did they burn all books, or did they just burn some books? Well, it was 70 well, it was years 70 ago years this, ago month, this when month when Adolf Hitler, Hitler marked, marked his first 100, 100 days, days in power, days power an event an marked by book, by book burnings. Now there's a now new there's exhibit, a new exhibit called, called Fighting the Fires, the Fires of Hate. It's, it's open at the Holocaust, Holocaust Museum, Museum in Washington, Washington D.C. And Tom Negevin spoke to one Philadelphia woman, woman about the about memories, memories it's bringing back for her. I would allow the whole clip to be seen by the students, but I wanted to give you an idea that um, of the real footage that it shows and that here is a survivor in the United States 70 years later still experiencing the lasting effects that that book burning um, and the whole uh, catastrophic events of World War II had on this one particular woman. So I would, after the initial warm-up, head into my lecture I'd begin by a quick five-minute kind of skim over who our, uh, Ray Bradbury is, the author of our book. Um, I am fascinated by his writing process, um, how he needed to seek refuge from two small children in his home, um, to, and he went to UCLA's library. Ray Bradbury loved his libraries. And he rented a typewriter for 10 cents a half hour. And so he sat there with a bag of dimes and wrote his book. And then he says nine days later, he's done with this book. I mean, that is just unreal to me. I know some authors can ponder over a book for years. So the fact that it just flowed right out of his head is just absolutely amazing to me. And then that he did it in such a public place. But I would share that 
um, information with the students and then head into what inspired him that Hitler's book burning was definitely had a lasting effect. It had happened just 10 years or 15 years prior to uh, when Ray Bradbury was a child and he saw those things um, on the news or he heard about those things and it had everlasting effects. But also just a simple thing as walking down the street and um, happening upon a police officer and smarting off to him and having that police officer not appreciate it too much. And so then he goes home to write The Pedestrian, which really kind of leads him into uh, Fahrenheit 451. So we would touch on a few of those things. I want to make sure that the kids know um, that this story really did just develop itself as Ray Bradbury in his existence, it came from him, and it came from his thoughts and his experiences, even though it was fictional. Um, after the back initial background of Ray Bradbury's life, um, I would want to talk about um, the time period in which he lived, um, known as the, the era of peace and prosperity, but it didn't quite act like the era of peace and prosperity. Um, a little bit of historical context for about 10 minutes, I know that's a short amount of time to touch on such um, major events in our history, but I would um, just want to refresh their memories of post-World War II and the aftermath of that war. Um, the Korean War ending just about the same time that the book was published. And then really it not being completely resolved in that um, we have the Cold War and we have the McCarthyism. And then, of course, the Atomic Age in which at the push of a button, um, life could be over for any of us. So a lot of fear it was supposed to be a time of peace, but yet it wasn't exactly a time of peace. And I wanted to make sure that that was known. People were not completely comfortable um, in their in, in their own homes, wondering about uh, what, what dangers were, were hidden next door or um, what would happen to them in the next day. So I, want, I would touch on that just a little bit and then talk about culture. So the culture of the world, with all of these fears and these wars, um, political statements being made, um, how did the the people how, how did Americans feel about themselves as they went went on through their daily lives so we saw a lot of social conformity um, cookie cutter houses um, suburbia many technological advances um, now we're all watching television we can see it with our own eyes um, it's not in our imagination any longer. It's not. It doesn't take uh, forever to get news out that it, we are seeing it as it's happening on our televisions. Uh, Segregation, the civil rights movement, and then censorship, um, making sure that one group feeling that they have the power to decide what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. So many many cultural views as a result of, of all of the political chaos and, and scares that are happening um, between, between wars and um, communism becoming more prevalent. The last part of the lecture, I would want to talk about the dystopian society. And Ray Bradbury's book is a dystopian society, but here in 2015, dystopian literature is extremely popular. So have we not advanced any? Um, was Ray Bradbury right? Um, I love his quote, I wasn't trying to predict the future, I was trying to prevent it. Uh, we needed to learn from it, but apparently we haven't learned from it yet because we're still seeing these dystopian society uh this dystopian literature come through. It's so popular. So either we haven't learned from it or maybe we just love 
that struggle. So uh, we find comfort in that struggle. Or maybe we just can't ever be satisfied. So I want, I, I want to pose a few questions and, and see what the class thinks of that. Um, why is the dystopian literature so popular still um, many years after uh, Ray Bradbury's book was initially written? So we look at, um, we bring in the technology that's, that's at our fingertips now, um, the scares of terrorists and homeland security. Uh, do we want to have the government paying attention to what we're doing so that they can keep us safe? Or do we not want the government paying attention because it's none of their business? So we have to find a happy median with please protect us government, but yet don't completely control us at the same time. Um, I think that would make some interesting conversations, especially with uh, dual credit students because they are about to embark on their adult life and they are very opinionated. So um, what is, how much is too much as far as the government co uh, controls that they put on us? Um, and then, as we finish up with the lecture, I, or with our discussion, I would like to point the kids in the direction that, as they read, look at all the things that Ray Bradbury, way back in 1953, decided that our future was going to be like. And keep track of those things and how accurate was he in his predictions. He wasn't trying to predict the future, he told us, but yet he made several, he created several inventions. He mentioned several things about our world and many of them have come true. So I would like for the students to kind of keep a log of this because this will be a topic that we will discuss after they have had a chance to read some of the novel, and probably a greater discussion even after the whole novel is complete. In my concluding remarks with the students, um, I would want to make sure that they understood exactly what was responsible from them that the next class that they meet, that they met with me. So I wanted to start off by reading part one, let them go home, dig into the novel. It's about, I think it's 68 pages. Um, they can read that part one and really get a good understanding of who this main character is and even pose the question, you know, what does the hearth and the salamander, what does that title mean to them? How can they explain um, the relevance to what's going on in the book? Um, and hopefully pique their interest a little bit to want to go through that novel and see what's happening. The idea of a fireman burning as opposed to putting out a fire is something that uh, goes against everything they were taught from when they were a little kid. So I'm hoping that piques their interest. Um, next, I would um, offer them their discussion questions. To be honest, I'd put their discussion questions on um, a discussion board, even if it was one question per discussion board, and ask them to comment there so they can see each other's comments. But I listed it out on a piece of paper so that, um, I mean, you could just see all five of them. And um, if I were to do a dual credit class at my school, we have an online classroom, so that would work very well for us. Um, it's not Blackboard, but it's very similar to that. So I would pose those questions there so they not only could answer, but they could also read each other's and offer feedback. Uh, and, and then have the feedback before they even come into class. So then it creates more discussion for us as they have questions and responses that are noteworthy. I divided my discussion question worksheet, if you will, into two sections. One, lecture feedback questions. So after the lecture is over and they've had a chance to kind of chew on the information for a little while, I want to see what they got out of it or if they have any deep thoughts about it. So I posed a couple of questions for them. And then I included two 
reading questions. So as they work their way through part one, they can, they can formulate their answers for their two reading questions and turn that in the next time we come to class. In future discussions, as I mentioned before, um, I would want to let them know where we're going next, and that would be to pay attention to the technological and cultural predictions um, that Bradbury makes in the novel. Uh, keep a little log of it. Put a sticky note on the computer. Put sticky notes in their book just so that they can um, list all of those together. I think it would be kind of a neat visual to eventually have all of those uh, predictions put up on a collage somewhere in the classroom where we could just kind of visually see all the things that he thought our world would turn into and maybe even break that into two separate collages things that he thought that were that ended up being false and things that he uh, came up with that ended up to to be true so that students students could see a little bit of that science fiction um, a visual representation of it but wonderful I remember in high school reading 1984 and it was 1989 when I read the book and just thinking how silly it was that this person had just thought that all these things would be happening but then it just wasn't 10 years later that many of those predictions uh, came true. And I love making the connection to the real world activities. And I share my stories with 19, about 1984 with my students because you just feel empowerment as you recognize these allusions to this great literature. And if I can pass that on um, with Fahrenheit 451, uh, yeah, Fahrenheit 451 to my students, then I definitely want to, to create that love for them too. Um, last section, reminders and considerations. The online discussion board for my class, besides using it just for four, uh, Fahrenheit 451, I would also just have an open discussion um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week that the students could get into and pose a question. They can ask about homework. They can ask about stuff if they missed my class for some reason. Um, they certainly can ask for some clarification in directions or in uh, particular questions. But I like to allow the students in the class the opportunity to respond to the students as well. One, because I'm not on my computer 24 hours a day, and two, um, I would rather a classmate appear, give them their explanation than the teacher because I think it means more. Plus, now I've got two people thinking about English and literature, so that makes me happy as well. Um, so I do encourage students to respond and post. I haven't quite decided how to uh, or if I ever need to give them credit for the class for doing that. Because a lot of them do go to um, to an, to a lot of work in order to make sure they have the right answer to give to a student, and and I really want to reward them in some way for that. But at the same time, I just want to keep it just there as a, a luxury, a tool that they can use. So, um, I really really enjoyed the book Fahrenheit 451, and I like to talk about books that I love. So I enjoyed this assignment, and I want to make sure that that joy is seen by the students. I don't expect every student to enjoy the books that I enjoy, but I do want to see if I can teach them how to pull something out of a book that can be useful to them. And maybe that's joy, and maybe that's just general knowledge, but... Um, Ray Bradbury is a character, and I really do uh, do enjoy um, talking about him and teaching students about him. And I really would some at some point also put um, one of his interviews into one of my lectures so that the students could actually see him talking about his books because. He's enthusiastic, and he is a joy to listen to. So that is my lesson for 
um, influences of Fahrenheit 451. I believe that it influenced, um, there were several influence, strong influences that Ray Radbury had um, in his life that led him to write that book. But I also think that Fahrenheit 451 gives our influences our world a little bit too and has um, kind of shown us uh, where where we're headed if we don't be careful. So thank you very much and um, let me know if you have any questions. All right, thank you.